everybody, and welcome to the California Small Farm Conference. Um, if you're here for the apprenticeship workshop, you're in the right place. Thanks so much for being here, and huge thanks to today's presenters. Um, go ahead and participate in the Q&A and chat, and uh, we hope you enjoy your workshop, and why don't you take it away from here. Thank you so much for being here. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining this session on creating pathways to success through agricultural apprenticeships. I'm Nicole Curiel, the California Farm Academy Outreach Coordinator with the Center for Land-Based Learning, and I'll be helping to moderate this session alongside our awesome panelists, which I'll introduce in just a second. So to, kick, to give a quick overview of our agenda today, we'll start off with our panelists' introductions before moving into a Zoom poll to help us understand who's in our audience today. And then we'll do uh, about a 30 minute panel discussion with a few pre-selected questions that really touch at the learning objectives mentioned in our workshop description. And lastly, we will have about 30 minutes of an, of an open forum Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the session, please put them in the Q&A QA box and we'll try to get to most of them before the end of the session as well. So without further ado, I'll introduce Marisa Alcorta as our first panelist. Thank you so much, Nicole, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Marisa Alcorta. I'm the California Farm Academy Apprenticeship Director. Um, and just some quick background on me. Um, I let's see. Um, I've I've worked in sustainable agriculture for about twenty plus years, and um, in various different roles. One of which um, is as an apprentice myself, um, also as a farm manager. And I've also owned and operated a couple of different farm businesses. And currently, uh, my husband and I own and operate uh, Terra Firma Farm alongside our partner, Hector Melendez and his wife, Elena. And we, um, we farm about 200 acres of organic fruits and vegetables and nuts in Winters, California. Um, and then in 2017, um, I helped launch our California Farm Academy apprenticeship program through the Center for Land-Based Learning. Um, we've been running this program for six years now. Yeah, <laughs> or maybe seven, and starting on our seventh year. And um, really the reason that we started it was as a response to growers asking us um, for help because they didn't have anyone who, they were, their farm managers were retiring and they didn't have anyone really coming up the ladder to replace them. And so they kind of turned to us and said, hey, is there a way that we can start building a skilled pipeline for us? So that's how this program was born. And um, we initially partnered with Soilborn Farm to um, get it going, which was really helpful. And we decided to make it a registered apprenticeship program, which has a whole, it's a whole world out there. Um, and we can talk about that later, but it's a big part of our program being registered. Um, yeah, so as it says here, it's, you know, two years long and we do cover the whole state. We have um, training, we have apprentices training in San Diego, all the way up to um, Placerville and Lincoln area. Um, the apprentices take 250 hours of coursework um, in various topics, and they have to complete 3,000 hours of paid on the job training. Um, and they also get wage advancements about every six months or so. So those are some of the pieces of our program. So yeah, I'll stop there and pass it on to Julie. Hi, everyone. My name is Julie Sullivan. I'm located actually in Colorado. I'm not in California, though I'm a native Californian originally. Um, so I am the mentor training support person for the Kivira Coalition's new agrarian program, which is an apprenticeship program, um, mainly on livestock ranches on large landscapes um, who are practicing regenerative practices. Um, the Kivira Coalition was founded about 20 years ago, and it was a meeting of conservationists and people uh, who were actually working on the land, trying to move past what at the time were the range wars, where there was a lot of controversy and polarization between the environmental community and the agricultural community. And a group of people decided to see if there was a way to find common ground because everyone loved the land. They just had different ways of understanding what that meant. And after a handful of years, um, the executive director of the Kivira Coalition realized that 
the intersection of agriculture with um, the mission of the organization really meant that we needed to be looking at where the next generation of ranchers and leaders in regenerative agriculture were going to come from. So in 2008, um, they reached out to myself and my husband, George Witten, here in the south central part of Colorado to help them create an apprenticeship program. The first apprenticeship was in 2009 here on our ranch, which happens to be a certified organic grass-fed cow-calf to finish operation. Um, and it has now grown to between 15 and 20 ranches, uh, mainly ranches, some farms in the Intermountain West. The program runs in four different states, California. We have two mentor sites in California, Colorado, New Mexico, Montana. We currently don't have any mentor sites in New Mexico, but we usually do. Um, and as the slide says, we target first career professionals, though we do often have some people who are making a career transition um, sort of in mid adulthood. But we, the program really is focused not so much on novices, but people who've had enough of a taste of our agricultural life that they feel like this is really where they want to spend their life's work. It's an eight month apprenticeship program. It's full time. Because we run in multiple states, we're dealing with um, our mentors do follow the labor laws of those individual states. Um, and then we have sort of an educational program, which is a constant, which the NAP program, the new agrarian program creates and then sort of oversees and helps to implement across all of those mentor sites. Um, we have about a hundred alumni at this point. And uh, it is possible for apprentices to do a second year in the program, should they so choose, and they have a mentor who is interested in continuing to work with them. And I think one of the things we really try to make a focus on is really doing a lot of mentor support and training. One of the things that um, we realized as we were creating this program was that um, there's a lot of focus placed on the young agrarian, a lot of interest and enthusiasm in that, but there aren't any training programs if there aren't mentors willing and eager and able to be mentors for those young agrarians. And that's the work that I do in our program. So I think that Michael is next. I think Michael might be frozen. Is that the same for everyone else, Marisa? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's jump to Jesse and then we can see if Michael's Wi Fi comes back. It is great timing, Michael. Uh, so <laughs> my name is Jesse Blackshire and I'm the current farm manager at Orange Vale Food Bank Farm, which is an offshoot of the Orange Vale Fair Oaks Community Foundation. And uh, last year we produced uh, just under 15,000 pounds for the neighboring food bank in Orangevale on our uh, just under one acre of, of land. So this is our, I believe, third year of operation and I'll be taking the reins over this year to um, try and apply what I learned through the apprenticeship and uh, you know take them to the next level as far as um, implementing practices uh, that I learned at, at Hillview, like. Um, low-till regenerative practices and um, uh, year-round growing practices. So that's kind of what I'll be uh, working on at the food bank there. And like I mentioned, I, I finished my apprenticeship program through Hillview Farms out in Lincoln with um, Michael there. And uh, before working at Hillview, I was employed with uh, UC Davis's Foundation Plants Serve. So short rundown for me. And I'll kick it back to Nicole. Yeah, Michael, is your Wi-Fi okay now? Let me see. Yeah, it'll be it'll be spotty a little bit. We got a big storm coming through, and it's that's just the way it is out in the country. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let me move it back to your slide, and then if your Wi-Fi gives out, I know sometimes turning off your camera works. So feel free to do that if that helps. Gotcha. Well, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm a my kind of portion of this will be the view of uh, the farmer. Our farm, just to give you like a background so that you know what kind of operation it is that when I'm speaking, it's gonna be through the lens of how I see farming. 
Um, our farm is CCOF certified organic. We're in the foothills. Um, we primarily do farmers markets and wholesale would be uh, co-ops and food hubs. Um, our farm is about less than five acres. Um, during my time farming, I've employed over about over like 30 different employees. Um, the most I've had at one time as a team would be eight employees. Um, and then I've been working with the CLBL for about three years. And um, I've had three different um, apprentices, apprenticeships on the farm. So that would be the background, kind of the lens of how, where I'm coming from and how I see the apprenticeship program. Awesome, thanks so much. Let me get back to the right side. So now that our panelists gave a little bit of their own personal introductions, we want to better understand who's in our audience today. So Evan, if you can go ahead and launch the Zoom poll, this is a quick question that is going to help us understand who's in our audience, that way our panelists are better able to frame their conversation um, and answer your questions as well. So if you go ahead and choose which option best fits you, that'd be great. And if you choose other, and want to explain a little bit more in the chat, that's welcome too. So I'll give it a few, a few minutes. Evan, and also if you want to tell me if you see most submissions already done, just like a thumbs up will help too. So I'll try to gauge. Sure thing. We're at about 65% participation. So maybe okay. give them a little bit longer there. Okay. <laughs> we'll go ahead and close that poll and share the results. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. So it looks like we have nearly half, a little bit less than half our farm employers interested in training an apprentice and then about an even split between the other three. So panelists, that's our demographics. Um, we'll use this information before we move into our open forum discussion and our panelists discussion as well. So without further ado, our first question for our panelists are, what are the difference between registered and non-registered apprenticeship programs? And as a reminder as well, if any questions come up from the audience throughout these conversations, please put them in the Q&A um, and then we'll answer them in the last 30 minutes. So I'll hand it over to Marisa and Julie for this question. Great, thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, Julie, I can, I can try to tackle this one first. Sure. Um, and then, yeah, you jump to chime in if you know anything. I'm missing anything. Um, so in California, at least, well, I guess I shouldn't say that. Federally, there are also registered apprenticeship programs um, nationwide, and I think the main difference is that um, they're recognized. Registered apprenticeships are recognized by the state or the Department of Labor, depending on who you register with. Um, in California, at least, I'll speak to that since I know that the best. Um, they model they model the trades. So, as you all probably have heard, you know, construction folks and firefighters, um, sheet metal workers, plumbers, they all have to. Those are all trade occupations, and they all have to do an apprenticeship as part of their training in order to get a license, which then allows them to um, practice their craft in the state or in the country. Um, and so this recently, California has recognized that there are also non-traditional uh, occupations that um, would benefit from registered apprenticeship training and programming. So um, that's, so, so we have to follow a model by the state. So the state requires that we have a certain number of on the job training hours. So you have to work with it. So there's two things, there's two pathways. You have to work for a number of hours with an employer um, to achieve your next level, which is journey worker. 
And you also have to complete a certain number of classroom hours to achieve that level of journey worker as well. And then we have to set up a, a stand, standards, which means like, what does our curriculum look like? We have to get that approved by um, a local education agency. So we actually have a governing board that governs our program. Um, it's made up of employers from the industry. It's made up of our division of apprenticeship standards uh, consultant business advisor that represents the state. It's made up of our local education agency who improves our curriculum. And then um, I think those are the main members. And then we have other partners sometimes that we just invite to the board to you know hear what's going on in our program. So that's really, I guess that's kind of my description. Um, there's also, in the past, we've had a lot of what we call, so those are, we call those big A apprenticeships. And then there's also little A apprenticeships, which are not registered. They're more informal. Um, we have a long history of little A apprenticeships um, in California. Not always great. Um, what ended up happening in 2008 is that uh, we, a lot of them started getting um, looked at by the Department of Labor Standards Enforcement. And it turned out that a lot of these informal apprenticeships or internships were um, not following labor laws in California, which are pretty strict. And so um, folks started cracking down and that's when a lot of farms just shut down their training programs. And that was kind of a crisis in California. So we started looking at, at the time I was working for a different organization and we started looking at what are some ways we can make sure that, you know, farm training programs still exist and we can still get that hands-on training on, on farms, um, but do it in a way that's legal and, you know, non-exploitative. So that's where a registered apprenticeship kind of came in and we had to kind of really work hard. Ours was the first registered apprenticeship program um, in agriculture in the state. And I will tell you, it was... <laughs> It was a lot to get it through um, because our industry is very different from the trades. So um, we had to do a lot of fighting to get what we thought would were fair standards and fair treatment. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'll stop there and pass it on to you, Julie. Okay. Um, you know, I agree with, you know, some of the things that you said, I think are really critical, whether whether you're thinking about doing a registered apprenticeship program or a small A apprenticeship program, which the, the new agrarian program is a small A, it is not a registered apprenticeship program at this point in time. Um, but I do think that regardless of what you do, the, the question of sort of um, what kind of oversight or accountability are you building into a program so that that um, some of those issues that you were referring to about p uh, programs that were sort of saying that they were educational, but really what they were, were underpaying people to do a lot of really hard and difficult work and not necessarily guaranteeing that there would be a continuum of learning. People would learn a few things and then sort of stall out rather than the intentionality that goes into any anything that calls itself an apprenticeship should be something where there is a constant influx of new opportunities to be learning so that that skill set is growing over however long the period is. So I think that one of the things that small A apprenticeship programs are doing is trying to replicate what's best about registered apprenticeship programs but also sort of have some flexibility, which wouldn't be possible if we were registered. So I can mention a few of those things. So I actually um, did a little homework before this panel um, and sort of looked up what are the key elements that are usually part of a registered apprenticeship program, because I wanted to see where a small A program could still be in alignment and where it might not be. So, um, one of the elements is that they're industry led, which man, means that the program is vetted by the professionals in that field. Mm -hmm. In the case of the new agrarian program, it was created by mentors and continues to be, um, you know, we get constant feedback both from our apprentices and from our mentors in order to make sure that we are still in alignment with what um, is considered appropriate training for our, and then, 
several of us who are staff are also either farmers or ranchers ourselves. So that helps us to sort of stay honest to that industry vetting. Um, it's paid. Um, in the case of a registered apprenticeship, there is sort of a, a predetermined progression of wage increase. In a small A apprenticeship program, the possibility of wage increase can be something that happens and a program can decide to require that of its mentors or its host farmers, or they can leave that up to the employer. Um, so in the case of our program, the apprentices are hired directly by their mentor site, and we have guidelines for that employment and require our mentors to follow labor law, but we don't dictate to them how that wage increase should happen over the course of eight months. If an apprentice stays for a second year, then we do step in with recommendations around increasing in compensation because of increased responsibility. But again, we have flexibility with that rather than having sort of a predetermined schedule. So there's pluses and minuses to that. Um, it's structured on the job mentoring. So we have a very structured um, program for our apprentices that we do require mentors to implement and, and then as a staff, we have monthly check-in meetings with our mentors as well as our apprentices to make sure the program is happening. So I think in some ways we really hold true to what a registered apprenticeship would require. One of the main differences I think is with supplemental education. We do do supplemental education for our program, but rather than have that be say college courses um, that are on particular topics, we actually kind of gather um, from our incoming cohort of apprentices what are the, the most pertinent pieces of information they're interested in. And again, because they're working across a large geographic spread and very diverse operations, we then tailor monthly supplemental education um, calls to sort of the most current and important topics. So we deal with climate change, we'll deal with land history and land access. So we'll sort of try to figure out what are topics that people um, are probably most interested in, but we don't do the deep dive that you get in a registered apprenticeship where you're taking a soil science class or um, dairy management classes or things like that. So I think that's one of the key differences. Um, Quality and safety, I think, is something that any apprenticeship program that calls itself a training program needs to be very, very conscientious about that. And again, that's something we vet all of our mentor sites in person. We go and do site visits before they're allowed to come into our program. And I would recommend that, that you have someone, you know, who is helping you. If you're an individual wanting to start a program on your site, that you have someone who's already doing it sort of help you assess where you may have systems that need to be um, upgraded in order to actually be safe for someone who's more of a novice. Um, the one thing that we don't have is an actual credential that's recognized in the way that um, a registered apprenticeship credential is. What we do have after 14 years with our program is a reputation, which I think has actually opened a lot of doors for our apprentices. So I do think that all of those things Marisa was talking about, and, and I've mentioned too, like really setting your standards high and making sure that you have some sort of accountability process is key regardless of whether you're large A or small A. And ultimately your reputation becomes a credential that those young people can take with them. That's really good, really good points, Julie. Um, I love how you laid that out, it was really clear. Um, and I guess I also am thinking about the farmers in the audience too. Um, some of the benefits through a registered apprenticeship program is that there because we have a standardized education? So there's a lot more. It sounds like there's a lot more flexibility, which is totally true. <laughs> like sometimes we come up against walls where we want to do something a certain way, but we can't because we're stuck with the rules from the state. The benefit of that is that we have the standardized curriculum, so that um, for on-the-job training, our apprentices have to get a minimum number of hours in a particular 
eight particular areas that you know, we come up with, with, with our employers. Um, and that's kind of our work, we call them work process areas. And um, one of them, for example, this is a good example, is tractor tractor skills, four-wheel tractor driving skills. Um, and that comes up as a question a lot with some of our smaller farms. Um, and whether they can count BCS as a tractor or not. And we say no, because um, we actually want them to have four-wheel tractor experience because it's actually a skill set that's incredibly valuable in a vegetable operation or any kind of you know, cropping operation. So the idea is that when you come out of our program, um, there's a standardized set of skills that you've gained, that you've um, had a minimum number of hours ex with experience on a farm with. And then when you have that journey worker card, you can go present it to a farmer and they will know exactly what skills you come with. Because um, what's happened in the past is you can you know, go to a farm and say, I've worked on two or three other farm operations and they say, okay, you have farm experience. So then you come on the farm, but then they ask you to drive a tractor and they're like, oh, I've never experienced a tractor actually. So that's where um, it helps to know kind of exactly what you're getting with this credential as an employer, because if somebody comes to you and says, we've done this program, here's my credential, then you can look it up and see exactly, you know, what kind of education they've gotten and what kind of skills they've gained on the farm. So that's one advantage as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, Julie and Marisa. Is there anything else to add for this question? Are you all okay with moving on to the next? Yes, I'll just say one thing, which is that um, we do have what we call the skills sheet curriculum, which I think, you know, sort of functions in the same way that you're talking about. But again, it, it is, it is, we present a template to our mentors and then they adjust that based on, you know, whether they have an operation which does use tractors or does, isn't seeding or whether it's lambing or it's cattle or whatever. So, um, so there is more variability, but we do try to make them state very clearly what an apprentice is going to be learning. And then they have to three times in the season actually rate themselves with their progression of growth. So they do have that as a document at the end of their eight months that demonstrates where they have strong skills and where they are still in more of that novice or beginner category. Yeah, that's good. And actually, we do also, we are kind of moving towards that model as well, Julie, um, after talking to you guys more about it too, um, because it, it, you know, we are able to, we, we, we work with farms, such a range of different farm operations. Our smallest farm is one acre. Our largest farm that we just onboarded is 12,000 acres. So we are, yeah, so we kind of have to be flexible in order to accommodate everyone's different operations and stuff. And, and that's great. We just, we have certain things we have to meet and then we can try to be flexible up, about the rest. And I think that works really well. Um, you, you have to be flexible in order to make sure that, you know, everyone is getting the education that they need. I did want to just quickly run by uh, one more thing, which is internships. Um, because that sometimes that also gets confused with apprenticeships. People will kind of conflate like small a intern or small a apprenticeships and internships. So an internship um, is often unpaid, which means you have to be a student to do the internship um, because the only students are really allowed to work for free on a for-profit operation in the whole country actually. So um, just so everyone knows, the federal law is that there are, volunteers are not allowed on for-profit operations. So that means farm operations across the board 100%. Um, whether the state enforces those laws is variable, like different states will may look the other way. In California, we've enforced those laws very, very much. Um, so, so that's something to know that volunteers cannot be on, you can't have a volunteer on your farm, that's illegal. Um, you have to have them paid, you have to follow labor laws, it means workers compensation, all those things. Internships um, can be short term, they can still happen on, on, on for profit farms, they can be short, they're usually shorter term, like a season, three months to six months, um, they just need to be paid workers' compensation needs to be provided. 
all the safety stuff needs to be happening. Um, but they're not usually a, like, like education, like, you know, doesn't usually happen off the farm alongside those internships. So the, in the same way that an apprenticeship does, it's potentially not as, dis, um, the education piece isn't as um, deliberate, I guess we should say. So I'll just put that there as well. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so we'll move on to our next question. So this will be primarily led by Michael, Julie, and then Marisa, you can also chime in, Jesse, you as well. So it's how can farm employers and mentors navigate the potential risk of hiring apprentices with minimal experience, specifically what hesitations exist and why? So I'll turn it over to our panelists now for that question. I'll, I'll, give, this a, I'll give this a start here. Great. So, um, yeah, I think there is, um, when you're hiring someone with minimal experience, we have quite a bit of turnover on the farm. So it is a, always quite a bit of an onboarding process. Um, the one thing I do love about the CLBL apprenticeship program is that it's a two-year commitment. So that really is a big incentive um, for me to have uh, apprentices on the farm because I know that they're gonna be around for a while. Um, the next part I really enjoyed was the third party accountability. And what I mean by that is with our check-ins, a lot of things when people are new to farming or have minimal experience or maybe hasn't been on a, a production scale farm is their pace. And so they're kind of slow or they're not, um, you know, moving at a profitable um, picking rate or packing rate. And so having those conversations with, with them and saying, you know, hey, you're going to, I got this from Jesse, actually, when someone told him you're going to have to move faster than you're comfortable with. And it's kind of really pushing them to that mindset of uh, for-profit profitability. And um, with the third party in our check-ins, instead of me just being the bag all the time with the CLBL, they're like, hey, this is the quality of standard that we're looking for in agriculture. And this is what we have to meet, either with pace or with um, showing up to work on time. And so there's kind of non-negotiables when it comes to really high quality farm workers. And it does help having that third party accountability to kind of like, hey, this is what it's like, not just that hill view, but this is the farm industry standard that you have to meet if you want to be in here. Um, the next with the, the third thing I really um, liked about it in was um, the positive culture that it brought. I thought that was something that was a bonus that I wasn't anticipating. Um, one thing that I really enjoyed with the CLBL apprenticeship is that they got to create a network outside of my farm with other apprentices. And so when things are going bad with weather or um, maybe like different conflicts that arise with maybe Packer or things, they kind of have this network that they can lean on and ask questions with, especially when it comes to like heat waves. Um, you know, misery kind of loves company. So, you know, when you're just on a farm looking at the same people all the time each day and you're just kind of hating it, it does kind of help to have like that outlet and be like, how's it going down in San Diego? How's it going in the Central Valley? Whoa, you're doing this. So I really kind of thought that added a benefit to my farm just with their networking and bringing it in. Um, the, the hesitations I had when I first did it was, um, what if it doesn't work out? And with the CLBL, it's like, hey, this is, you're, you're, you're an employer, this is your worker. If it's not working out, it's just not working out. So that kind of took some of the ease off of like, you know, if this, if this is just someone that's not fitting our culture or model, then that hasn't been a problem because um, they do a really good vetting process, but that was one of the hesitations I had and it's, it's not a big deal. Um, the other thing that you have to go through is, um, you know, you just require a little bit more work. It's not substantially a lot more work, but you do have to do um, kind of meetup, greetups with different things. The, um, they will go to training sessions, um, but the communication is pretty good. Um, but overall, I think the experience that 
we've had on the farm, having apprentices is definitely worth the risk of hiring one and reaching out to other people, whether it's the CLB or other organizations to have um, apprenticeships on your farm. That was great. Um, you know, I would say that th that that really rings true, I think, for um, the mentors in our program as well. So I think, um, you know, I think what we have found is that we, we actually don't try to talk anybody in to being a mentor. We actually try to talk people out of being mentors, because I think you have to recognize that at least initially, uh, the way one um, mentor puts it, initially, um, bringing in someone who's a novice or even someone who only has one or two seasons under their belt, um, they're, they're more of a liability than they are a benefit for a period of time. And that's not just because things may get broken or um, you know, th there's a new tool that they're not familiar with, but just the fact that um, it's five times harder to do something you don't know how to do than it is to do something you already know how to do. I mean, it is, you know, there have been studies done. So, so at the end of the day, a novice learning how to work on your operation has worked five times harder than you did. And they got less done on sort of that bottom line production level. And so you have to really want to be teaching. You have to really want to be mentoring. There has to be some part of you and some capacity in your operation to be able to handle that. And that if your operation isn't in a place where that's possible, you know, taking on a novice may actually not be the right idea, or it may not be the right idea this year. And so I think the first question we ask anybody who wants to be a mentor in our operation is in our program is basically why? So that we can weed out anybody who doesn't have um, sort of the operational resilience as well as the personal desire to be a mentor. Be because that's just the reality of the situation. So I think that that's the first thing is let's just be honest about it. You're bringing on someone who doesn't know what they're doing. So don't expect them to know how to do it in a week. That would be an unfair expectation and it would create misery for you and for the person you brought on. And that's not something anybody wants. So. I think that there are a lot of things that you can do, uh, again, whether you're an organization thinking about creating a program, whether you are a farmer or a rancher who's wanting to perhaps start your own program. Um, and I think that this applies to, to um, people who are looking for apprenticeship opportunities. I think all of these are things we've tried to build into our program. So first of all, we have a fairly um, substantial application. Um, because um, it used to be that we would require as part of our interview process that everyone did a site visit. Now that our mentor operations are so scattered, it isn't fair to ask somebody who perhaps is in New Jersey to travel to, to Montana for a site visit as part of an interview. It's just, you know, uh, unaffordable. But um, I think when it's possible to meet in person and have a work day together, and see whether your mentoring style and um, you know the adaptability is the landscape something that speaks to somebody. All of those are things that will help. So we have a rather um, long and thorough application process and interview process. Um, and uh, in our program, the um, regional coordinators read all of the applications as well as the mentors. And then they do interviews with usually about six people and then second interviews with their top candidates. So by the time someone is arriving on site, there has been a lot of communication and contact already, even if it's all been virtual. Um, call references. Um, it's amazing how often I don't get called to offer a reference for someone who has worked here with us. Um, it is invaluable to ask for a reference and to speak to references and to ask real questions to references. And as part of the resources we have um, in our program, we have sort of a list of questions to ask references 
to try to find out deeper things about, um, you know, you're hiring somebody into an educational role and what kind of learner are they and what kind of support do they need so that you end up choosing somebody who's going to align with the kind of time and energy you have to train them. I think that that's really key. There are a lot of things that you can do as the person creating the program or hiring somebody to make sure that you pick somebody that's a good fit. Um, one of the things we do, that skill sheet that I mentioned before is in the first week that someone arrives on site or sometimes even before they arrive on their mentor site, they fill out a baseline of all of the skills they're going to be exposed to or be asked to learn um, where they rate themselves incoming as, you know, is this something they've ever done before? Do they not even know what you're talking about? Is this something they feel fairly competent with daily operations? And then in that first um, 10 days on site, the mentor actually sits down with the apprentice and reviews that entire skill sheet and really talks about where someone's incoming skills are, where they feel that they can be useful um, immediately because everyone wants to be useful the moment that they show up on site and where are the places where they're going to need a little extra training and time. We also really encourage our mentors to work alongside the apprentice as much as they can whenever there's a new skill so that um, the apprentice learns directly from you. And again, our operations usually only have one or two apprentices. Um, and so they're not, the mentors aren't being asked to try to train eight or 10 or 12 people all at the same time. So I realize that kind of hands-on, one-on-one job shadowing kind of situation may not be appropriate on a lot of operations, but it's something that we found helps you recognize early on where the, where the places where this young person is really adept and learns quickly, where are the places where they're accident prone, where they aren't thorough, where I'm going to need to be able to have a little additional patience and time in order to help them get up to speed. Um, I think the idea of, a, of the cohort, you know, uh, to being able to talk to one another um, and fostering that as a mentor, recognizing that um, I time away either to go visit another spot, another mentor operation helps an apprentice realize what they've learned and they come back usually enthusiastic and re-engaged. So those are all things that we found really help us not only navigate the risk of hiring somebody who may not be a good fit, but once you have hired somebody, rather than becoming frustrated and feeling like it's a failure right from the get-go, what are those extra things that you may or may not be able to do? And think about those before you even start your interview process. How much time and energy do you really have? How much patience do you have? Where are the places where you absolutely cannot handle accidents and mistakes? How much give do you have in your operation to be able to accommodate that? And then tailor your advertising and your interview process to, to be realistic about what you really need and what kind of training you can actually offer. Marisa, do you have anything to add as with the perspective of a program manager, but also as a farmer? I think, yeah, I mean, this is definitely tricky. Um, <laughs> yeah, our, our particular farm, we definitely don't hire people with little experience. I think it's just because the capacity of our farm doesn't allow that. Like Julie was saying, there's some farms that just don't, you know, can't handle that. Um, you know, we're, you know, we're um, kind of in the middle in terms of size and we don't have the bandwidth really to take folks aside and spend time training them. So, um, so yeah, it, it, I think it really depends on the farm operation. And it is a commitment though, um, for farm employers. I think there are farm employers who really, I mean, the, obviously the ones that we work with really see like Michael, um, really see it as an investment, uh, in the time that they put in, into, um, a continuity of their, of their farm 
their labor and their farm staff and growing someone into a position where they can start taking things off of the farm owner's plate, I think has a appeal um, and an advantage as well. So that, so, and we've also worked with farms who, larger scale farms actually, who are looking for farm managers and they've just hired people and it hasn't worked out and hired people and it hasn't worked out and hired people and it hasn't worked out. And finally, they came to us and just said, you know, we've just realized that we just need to grow our own. And that means that hiring someone with minimal experience and investing the time in to train them up um, to do exactly what they need them to do in the operation. So um, again, like it just really depends on the farm. And yeah, I can see the advantages and disadvantages to that as well. I just want to echo what Lisa said, which was um, like for us, we we had um, two apprentices who came to us three years ago. They did two years of apprenticeship with us. They stayed on for a third year as employees and now they're assistant managers and they're actually helping us create management succession um, planning and really pivoting the business in the face of climate change and some of the other challenges. So I do think that if you're at, you're in a situation where um, having someone who has deep buy-in mm -hmm. to who you are, what you do, your principles and your practices, they may be worth the time and energy that it takes to train them um, because of what they're going to be able to give back to you. And I think that that's something that we hear over and over and over from our mentors, that that is more than the labor of a of a young, hearty, interested um, person is feeling like you have someone on your operation who really appreciates and understands why you do the what you do in the way that you do it. and And that is um, deeply rewarding and really feeds your soul in this incredibly difficult work that we're all trying to do. Awesome. Okay, let's move on to our last question in this discussion, which is what are the characteristics of a good apprenticeship program and what should people look for, both apprentices and employers alike? Um, and I'll turn this question over to Jesse first, and then our other panelists can chime in as well. So. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I kind of broke this question down into three sort of approachable uh, categories. And keeping with the theme, I tried to make them all A words. It's not an exact fit, but forgive me for that. So it's accreditation, uh, accountability, and affordability. So those are kind of the, the little blocks that I'll go over. And a lot of these points have, have been raised by my fellow panelists too. So forgive any uh, overlaps as well. But um, in tying in with Marisa's excellent point about the uh, registered versus non-registered, you know, accreditation isn't a be all end all on the employee side, but it definitely goes a long way in establishing value and buy-in for the employee. So if you were to evaluate something coming in as a prospective apprentice, you would kind of think, what does this offer me specifically? And where do I want this to take me at the end of this road? And that's a really important thing to consider, especially considering the, uh, the time investment. In, in one of these programs. So that'll kind of tie into some of my later points too. But uh, the second one, accountability, uh, was, was kind of mentioned by Michael a little bit. And that, that's an excellent point as well, because it definitely does help. And I would say that it's necessary to have a third party that is kind of remediating between the employee and the employer in that specific relationship because you have to kind of approach it with the question of, are there people I can ask for help who are not invested in um, you know, the farm business that I'm working for? And who are those people and you know, where, where will they uh, be able to help me in, in this journey? Um, on, on that similar kind of track, uh, transparency is really important in these, these programs. So, you know, doing your, your homework on what the sort of clearance rate is, uh, what, what any associated costs would be. That's also very important, uh, you know, a very important factor to take into account. Um, and one 
thing that I noticed it with some of my cohorts, especially was uh, it's important to determine if this program has any kind of policy for transferring to a different farm in the event of any kind of circumstance that may arise. So um, there should be a, a well-established policy or, or it should be established at least that there is no such policy. And so you, you'd kind of go in informed knowing, you know, you may give up the progress that you've made in the apprenticeship program if you decide to terminate your relationship with that specific employer. So, you know, that, that's not always to say that you have to leave a place of work because of any kind of conflict, but life happens, you know, it's, it's still farming. That's something to look for as well. And then affordability, um, kind of tying into my, my earlier point about accreditation and what, what does this offer? You know, it's uh, the CLBLs program is, is unique and, and very valuable because it is free of charge to the employee. So there's no, um, you know, cost of ad admission based. So you can, you can get in at the ground level and it's not an investment of money, but it is a substantial investment in time. So you have to ask yourself, is, is the investment in time worth, worth it to me uh, as far as the accreditation you know, value question? What, what will I be getting out of this for all this time and effort that I'm going to put into this? So that's a huge thing to consider and something that you know, I, I don't even think I was personally prepared to answer at the very beginning. So it's okay if you don't have that answer, but it, it is important to, you know, take stock of what, what it actually requires of you. Uh, and then I liked, um, Julie, your point about, I, I wrote it down, operational resilience. You know, that's, that's such a great uh, turn of phrase for the employer side, but also for the employee side, because you really have to age for yourself, you know, what, what is my operational resilience as far as being able to complete this program and uh, perform as, as everyone needs me to. So that's, uh, that's about all my key points on that. Great. Thanks, Jesse. Michael, do you have anything to add to that from your perspective as an employer? What do you look for? What have you noticed? Um, I've only had the experience of working with one program and they've been great, the CLBL. Um, if I was an apprenticeship, you know, I would definitely kind of look to see, and some of these have been echoed, um, but I would look to see, you know, what those people are doing now that have graduated the program. And um, also I think one of the benefits is, is the strong networking that comes with these programs if you're a farmer apprentice. It's, you know, and one thing we talk about a lot when, you know, Jesse or other people are getting closer to the end of the program is what's the next step? What's, what's your career goals? And, you know, this is something that maybe I don't talk about with all the other um, em employees of mine, but, you know, it's like, hey, what do you want to do with your life? Where's the stepping stone? So I think that's a huge advantage. And then the networking with that is a big thing. So, you know, having this kind of network is such a positive for the rest of your career or your farming journey that it's that alone I think is worth it. On that similar note, Michael, can you just give a few points as to what an employer can gain from having and training an apprentice? I feel like some of the points that we touched on were really, you know, on the perspective of how an apprentice themselves can gauge and vet an apprenticeship program, but you as an employer, what do you gain from having and training apprentices on your farm? And you've trained three, so. Yeah, I think the commitment. So when you're, you have more buy-in for longer term, and that's huge when you're training somebody. Um, when you're a farm manager or owner, the amount of energy that goes into getting someone onboarded is really exhaustive. And it's, it, it kind of, you know, you get kind of burned out after you're doing this for a while and it's every year people leave and you're doing it again and you're, and you're creating SOPs, you know, just for like people one or two years. And so this really gives a buy-in. I, I love, 
if you have someone that's really good on your team, I think one of the things that you should be asking them is to join this program because you want them to stay longer and have bigger buy-in to your farm. And then it gives them a more clear path of where they see the farm going and kind of the, um, the levels that they can achieve at your farm while also getting paid more to do the work. So the longer they're on the farm, the more um, responsibility that they get, the more compensation they get. And the CLBL is, uh, or apprenticeship programs add value to you so that they're learning stuff outside and having that commitment, you know, like, wow, they're going to, they're doing an eight, 10 hour day driving to another class to do a workshop coming back in the morning. I mean, you're very committed and it, it, it brings like a really good culture on the farm. And um, I think that commitment is one of the biggest aspects and, um, it does drive like the people that want to do this are usually high character and want to be here. So that's, that's my biggest thing. Marisa, Julie, anything to add? I was just going to tag on to what Michael just said about the sort of the benefit to the employer or the mentor, you know, speaking, um, you know, we've been mentors here now for 14 years, nonstop. Um, and I think one of the things that mentors really get from being associated with a program rather than just be doing it on their own is the fact that there's that connection to an organization and that organization's network. It's not just the, their, their own cohort of apprentices in their season that they might get to know, but there's 14 years worth of alumni now that and they are just automatically connected to those people and they're automatically connected to all of these people in the larger Kivira um, network. You know, an apprentice who's gone through a program that has is somehow affiliated with some other entity has that entity's connections that will help open doors for them. And that supports the mentor because that helps the mentor support the apprentice in that sort of career trajectory that was being discussed. One of the other real benefits I think that we have with for our mentors, for our, the employers being associated with a program rather than doing this in isolation is that when there are conflicts, which there always are, um, they do have, th that the mentor has someone to go to too that they have a coordinator that they can reach out to and say, hey, you know, I like, you know, it's been really stressful on the farm. I haven't had a whole lot of time to be spending with my apprentice. I can tell that they're kind of in the doldrums. Their work has fallen off. I'm not really sure how to handle that or some kind of conflict or difficulty comes up that the mentor actually has support as well so that they can continue to offer that quality training I think that mentor burnout is a, is a real possibility and often happens. And I think that affiliation with programs like CLBL or our program or Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship or Rogue Farm Corps, or some of these programs that they, there's a support network for the mentor as well as for the apprentice. And that helps with the longevity of the program and that connectivity that um, allows for um, the, uh, the apprentice to continue to, to be um, affiliated with something that's ongoing and ideally maybe turn around and actually become a mentor themselves. Um, I wanna, yeah, echo that point, Julie. That was, that's a really important um, about the support that uh, like working with a program can offer. Um, because I think I've seen, you know, farms actually try to do their own internal apprenticeship programs where they're doing the, they're doing the education, they're doing the evaluation, they're doing all the things they're on their own, and they're trying to farm at the same time. And that's just super difficult. So I think, um, you know, partnering with an organization, there's a real advantage to that, whether it's a registered apprenticeship or a, a non-registered apprenticeship, I still I agree with Julie. Um, we don't we don't just mediate the conflicts. I mean, we definitely have done that, um, but we also, you know, do all the admin side that 
keeps things operating smoothly for everyone. So everything from um, the initial applications and vetting, I mean, we also have an incredibly lengthy, long application process, um, but we have two streams of intake for our apprentices. One is folks who are just interested in working on a farm who come from off the farm. And then we also have a second stream, which is employers will often approach us and say, I have someone on my operation already um, who I want to run through the program. And those we call incumbent workers. And that's often like a much more successful um, apprenticeship because they're already invested in each other, which is really fantastic. Um, but so, but for the folks that come off the farm, we have this incredibly long like vetting process and we have to come up with, you know, established rules. So for our program, we just recently up updated our requirements um, so that applicants have to have at least 12 months of on-farm experience um, and farmers have to have at least 10 years of farming experience and they have to have employed employees before, like this can't be their first employee. Um, and so thinking about what characteristics, you know, are of a good apprenticeship, I think, honestly, it's that mentors also need to have enough experience with employees and also with farming. Because I, I would say out of like, I don't know, I think maybe 95% of the times when it's gone awry and people have had to leave or quit or whatever, it's been because either the farmer is just too new of a farmer and they aren't, they don't have, they're still learning themselves and they don't have enough um, like bandwidth to like learn what they need to learn and also be training someone else. Or the apprentice comes in with like absolutely zero experience and um, or too little experience to really know that this is what they want to do and continue doing it. And they can't um, keep up with the pace, you know, like they haven't done it enough to, to know that this isn't something that maybe their body can't really, you know, do. Um, so I would say that's one thing is that the mentors need to be well vetted. Um, and also the applicants. So we have a very long process, like I said, for both of those things. I would also say um, the educational support. So again, like working with the third party, uh, the farmer shouldn't have to do all the education. You know, having the apprentices go to classes, like Michael mentioned, um, and I think Jesse too, like, you know, being able to do that training off the farm and have that being taken on by someone else, I think is a huge benefit. And for us, you know, we really try to make the training contextualized in a farming operation. So, um, you know, we take what, you know, we, we take what you would learn at a community college level class, but we break that down and we compact it because you have to be, you're working full time. You don't have time to take like a full on community college class. We break it down into pieces so that what's we're asking, what's really relevant to a farm that you need to learn that's practical about this particular topic. Um, and for us, it's intro to soil science, intro to plant science, irrigation management, and integrated pest management. Um, and so what are the pieces in those topics that really apply to the farm? And that's what we're teaching. So that then we also have them do lab assignments where they go back to their farm and they have to do all these things as part of their curriculum on the operation. Um, yeah, so I just wanna say um, the other pieces of that like admin support are um, that we also, set up policies and procedures that folks can follow. So making sure that everybody has expectations that they can follow. And then like, we also track their hours. So that's another thing that's, you know, we, we track their hours in um, the coursework, we track their hours in their employment, we track their skill gains and we do all the evaluations. We have, I think, um, three different evaluation periods uh, during the, the course of the two-year program. And I, Michael was referring to those, I think, earlier, where it's also accountability. It's like, how are things going? And if it's not going well, let's talk about it and figure out you know, why. And it's an opportunity for us to um, kind of just do some course corrections if things aren't going right. 
So yeah, those are the main things I would contribute to this question. Awesome, thanks Marisa. So we're gonna move into our open forum Q&A. There's currently four questions in the chat. Two of them I feel can be answered together and we kind of already touched on them a bit, but I'm gonna hand it over to Marisa to answer a little bit more um, thoroughly. So one says, could you please provide the outline or template of the big A ag apprenticeship in California and the curriculum? And then the second question is, is there access to view the curriculum? So I know you kind of just gave an overview of what our related supplemental instruction for the Center for Land-Based Learning Apprenticeship looks like. Um, but do you want to add a little bit more, explain how that curriculum is chosen, um, and then maybe also just the structure of a registered apprenticeship program in California? I mean, ours specifically. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, um, let's see. So for the related supplemental instruction, a, reg a registered apprenticeship program requires 144 hours per year. Um, and we actually fall a little bit short on that. And I don't know how we got approved. So well, they let us deal with that. <laughs> we, we got grandfathered in. Um, but so that's over two years. And the courses that we um, require as our core courses, like I said, plant science, soil science, um, irrigation management, ag irrigation management, where we cover all types of irrigation, um, and then IPM. We also have leadership and management as a really big part of our curriculum, because as a farm manager, if we're training people to become farm managers, we're actually training them to manage people. And when we when we survey our employers, and not just our employers, like employers across the state, we've done this multiple times. And we ask like, what, what are the most important skills that you would want in an employee? It's, or in a manager, it's, you know, decision-making, communication, leadership, and management, managing people. Those are the main things that come back. Um, so that's what we've been trying to build up over the last few years. I think 2021 was the first time we offered leadership and management classes. And then in 2022, we, um, I would say, upgraded to a, a much um, more uh, relevant course in that. And then we're actually in the process of designing a second leadership and management class that's going to be more advanced for our second years, um, where we're also going to be including um, things like understanding budgets, understanding labor budgets, understanding cost of production, understanding um, labor laws because those are also all things that are really relevant for California farmers to understand. Um, and then at the same time, you know, more of that managerial, um, it's gonna be longer, you know, training about how do you deal with people? It's, I think everyone needs to learn those skills. It's really hard. So um, I think I answered the question, yeah. Okay. Yeah, awesome. So one other question is, whose responsibility is it to pay for both the big A and the small A apprentices? Are they considered an employee of the farmer ranch that they're paired with? So. Yeah, for, for us, um, the state of California does not allow uh, apprentices, registered apprentices to pay for any of their education. So, we, the California Farm Academy Apprenticeship Program, we do pay for that education. You can partner with um, a community college if you want to, and they actually should be able to draw down funds from the state that cover uh, apprenticeship apprentices. So that's actually something we we're aiming towards. Um, we actually tried to work with the community college in the past to, to run our classes, but it just didn't work out because of the, the, the length of commitment and timing that it's just so intense. You're a full-time student when you're going to a community college and we're asking our apprentices to also be full-time you know, farm employees. So that didn't match up very well, um, but that's another thing you can do. So the, the community colleges will pay for it, the education. Um, and then we ask our employers to just pay the wages. So, um, but like I said, the state does require a wage advancement. So we have a wage advancement schedule that goes up every time they hit a certain number of on-the-job training hours and a certain number of RSI hours. And it happens approximately every six months. Um, so we, we've set it as a 50 cent wage increase every six months. 
In our program, um, the apprentices are hired by their mentor site as a waged employee and they have workers' compensation and unemployment insurance and they have to follow the labor laws of whatever state they're in. So that's a relationship between the mentor and the employee. Um, but we do get, the as a program, we um, facilitate the creation of employment agreements or contracts. We make sure that all of that paperwork is submitted appropriately. In addition to their wages, um, the program then, the new agrarian program, has additional funds where we um, uh, pay for their conference um, attendance and um, lodging and food at our, the annual conference that is held by American Grassfit Association, Holistic Management International, and the Kivira Coalition all together. So um, that's a, a that's also graduation for them. It's a phenomenal networking opportunity for our apprentices. So they're completely covered, um, including their travel to attend that conference. There's usually at least one, if not two in-person workshops and the program pays for those workshops, um, pays whoever is offering the workshop, pays um, mileage for apprentices to attend. And again, you know, some of our apprentices are in extremely remote parts of Montana, they have, you know, hours and hours and hours of driving to get somewhere. And so the program underwrites that. And in addition, we've started to be able to actually have some additional funds for technical assistance and leadership training post-graduation. So we're able to actually offer a lot more alumni support now as well as a program. Um, so there's not only the wages and there's no cost to the apprentice to it to um, be part of the program. Our mentors have also historically been required to provide housing and some form of board. Um, and again, that that's starting to be variable site to site based on the way um, labor law has been changing in the states we run in. Yeah, I just want to add that we um... We also do all those things that, that Julie said. We pay for apprentice mileage and travel if we require them to attend a conference or to attend a field trip that we're setting up or an in-person class. All of our classes are actually online because we wanna be able to reach our apprentices across the state. But every class we run, we have at least one in-person day, which we require the apprentices to attend. And then we pay for all of their travel and their lodging if they require it. Um, and then, yes, I should clarify that our employers are hiring apprentices as their own employees separately. That's a, that's a, you know, they have to do all their own paperwork. They're hiring them as their own employee. And then there's just an agreement that we all sign that they sign to register with the state as a trainer. Um, and then they sign it with us to follow our standards um, and, you know, the, the program rules and policies that we set out. Perfect. Next question is, are the application, what are the application timelines for your apprenticeship programs? And are there any minimum eligibility requirements? How do, how can somebody who's interested in participating in an apprenticeship program gain the initial experience in farming to qualify? So. Well, and if with our program, um, if there are any uh, sort of required skills, that's determined by each mentor site. So our application period usually opens on November 1st. It historically has closed on December 15th. Um, our program sends out a monthly newsletter that has jobs and apprenticeships and sort of a, a story usually in it. And that will also be a way, if somebody signs up for that newsletter, they will automatically also receive the announcement when applications open. And then they just go on the website and all of the mentor sites have very, very detailed descriptions of where the operation is, what they raise, why they do it the way they do, some of their land management philosophies, their land stewardship visions, and then a lot of details, nuts and bolts details about the actual position because those do vary site to site. And then apprentices apply to up to five different operations inside the program. Um, usually um, applications close December 15th, Initial interviews start relatively promptly after that. Most positions are filled by February 1st because most 
of our apprentices need to be on site sometime in early to mid-March before lambing or calving season begins. Again, most of our operations are livestock based. And so we want to give apprentices ample time to be able to relocate um, and uh, you know, do whatever they need to do to be able to move to Malta, Montana or some other place that nobody's ever heard about for eight months. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, so our, our program has year round application and, and, um, and enrollment. So we don't ever close. We, we don't have a period. People are coming in all the time and applying all the time. Um, we do require, like I said earlier, that you have 12 months of experience on the farm, on a farm, uh, a commercial operation, actually, not a nonprofit farm, um, before applying. That's just to make you eligible to apply. Um, and our process, our application process is pretty lengthy. Like I said, you have to do a pre-application, which just kind of gets the basic qualifications down. Like, do you have a driver's license? Are you over 18? There's just like some basic things. Do you have permission to work in the United States? If they're an incumbent worker, we don't usually ask that question, but for folks who are applying out off the farm, we do. Um, and then uh, we do a phone call. <laughs> and to make sure that this is really the right program for them, that they really wanna be a farm manager. And then we do a uh, formal application where we ask a whole bunch of questions. And that one, we end up uh, scoring. We have a whole rubric that we use to rank and score our um, answers. And then if they get a high enough score, then they enter into our applicant pool. And that means that they, can now their application can be seen by a farm employer who has, we have also vetted and have included in our program. Um, so the farmers are actually the ones that read those applications and they make the job offers or ask to do an interview. Um, and they do the hiring. So that's how that one works. Um, we don't we don't require our employers to provide housing. Um, and that can be really tough in some areas like on the coast and things like that, it's really difficult to find housing or certain areas um, in the foothills. That's hard too. So that is tough. But we, um, it's part of you know every farm business. It's just part of what they have to deal with. Is housing is a huge issue. Um, I think. Oh yeah, for folks who don't qualify for our for our program yet. We really just recommend that you find short-term farming experiences and jobs um, wherever you can and just build that up over time. Um, and we, if you apply to our program and you and you aren't qualified, we actually um, put you on a list and we send out uh, short-term jobs that we that come our way on farms um, every once in a while when we get them. So we have this whole group of people who, who don't qualify, but who we try to send those job applications or job opportunities to um, on a regular basis. So that's another way that you know we can, but there's a whole bunch. We can also point you to a whole bunch of different websites. CAF actually has a really wonderful uh, job site where you can find some short-term opportunities as well. Awesome. Okay, so there's one more question in the Q&A. So it says actually two now. So the first one says Julie had mentioned doing a baseline survey with new apprentices. And so there's a few questions from that. A, the CLBL do similar surveys of apprentices or skill assessments. Um, and then what trends do you, Julie Marisa, have seen over the years? Yes, we do do a similar assessment. We have a whole skills survey that we ask our apprentices to fill out. Jesse knows it well <laughs> that we have to fill out at the very beginning when you first onboard. Um, and then we redo it every year. So um, we do a six month evaluation, but we don't have them redo that skill set. It's more just like a verbal, um, like a qualitative, like how are things going? What are the things that you're learning? Where do you feel like you want to improve or learn more on? But at the one year, we ask them to retake that assessment, that baseline assessment, and then we can compare how their um, skills are improving or not. And if they're not improving, then we have a conversation with the farmer about how can, you know, is this an appropriate area for them to continue 
um, working on and how are we going to get them that experience. And then at the very end of the program, as part of their exit interview, they do that again, so that then we can see over two years, you know, how much skills they've gained in, in those different, um, yeah, skill areas. Um, so yeah, with our with our skills sheet, we do that baseline, and then uh, usually about four months in, so halfway through the apprenticeship, um, there's a, a formal sitting down the, between the mentor and the apprentice to do exactly as Marisa said, sort of like assess where is the learning happening, and that we really see that as an opportunity for course correction. That if there's a place that is really getting forgotten or mislaid that is of particular importance to the apprentice in particular. When they do their baseline, we also ask them to indicate if there are particular skills that they feel are most pertinent and necessary for them for their personal career goals so that we're trying to, granted the the farmer or ranch needs them to learn the things that the farmer ranch is most needing them to learn. But if they can also add in a few other things, we like to know that. So we'll do that course correction mid-season, actually maybe sometimes create even more formal learning plans to make sure that that learning doesn't get lost in the shuffle. And then we do a final one, usually about six weeks before graduation. And that's really an opportunity for um, the mentor to support the apprentice in figuring, figuring out what's really the next best step for them professionally and help them start to create that networking and those connections if they're not going to stay for a second year. Um, and so was there, a, was the other question about trends? Was that the? Yes, it says, what trends have Julie Marisa seen over the years? And I think maybe that might be in reference to like the skills assessments and the knowledge gained throughout the duration of each program, I guess you can say for apprentices. And Jesse, if you wanna chime in as well as how those skill assessments um, and surveys and evaluations help you progress through the program, that'd be great too. I'd actually love to hear from Jesse about this, if you're up for it, Jesse. Uh, yeah, I can do a little improv jazz. Um, so briefly, yeah, it, it really helps to uh, track track my own progress um, in going through the program and, and kind of like Julie was saying, um, you know, keeping yourself accountable and also uh, being uh, held accountable to to a standard that already exists, it's um, definitely makes it feel uh, a lot more structured and uh, uh, academic um, rigor. Was that was that adequate? I'm not sure what the other parts of the question there might be. Yeah. What is that, Julie? What about overall trends that you've seen throughout the times or your time in the programs, both at the new agrarian program and the apprenticeship CLBL? You can go first, Julie. So is this trends overall in the program or trends specifically with the skills sheet process? You know, I'm not sure. It wasn't clear in the question. Um, if the person who submitted this question wants to unmute and clarify what they meant, that'd be great. But why don't we just answer kind of both to cover both ends <laughs> of the program and also in terms of the skills assessment? Um, I would say, um, so, so it says mainly the surveys. Okay. Um, a couple things. I would say that um, in general in our program, um, it's become a little bit more competitive. We, we very seldom have people come into the program now who are complete novices. Um, usually they have a little livestock experience. Sometimes it's been in vegetable farming. Um, but I would say that um, the, the main thing isn't really a, a shift, but I would say in general, everybody has places where they grow really quickly. And they just sort of have a natural capacity to gain that skill, whether it's understanding um, the finances of the operation, or they're really great at being a team member and really helping to support and draw out the strengths of other people in the crew, or they're someone who's just a natural at animal handling, but they are terrible at electric fence. So I would say that that is always a constant that everyone comes in with some place where they have a, a great gift and they realize it. 
And everybody comes in with the place where the, in eight months, they may not move the dial very far. Um, so um, I think the main thing that we're finding is when, when someone is really struggling to achieve a skill, I think that as a program, we're trying to help our mentors become more adept and versatile as educators, so that when an apprentice is stalling um, between the program and the mentor, we can find a way to um, help that person get past feeling disheart disheartened or feeling like they're failing because they're not learning as quickly as they would like to. So I think that that's the main. The other thing I'll say is over the 14 years, I would say that people, uh, people are impatient to become in charge, um, that the the earlier they are in the in their career, often the sooner that they want to really be in charge, and that the people who've been doing this for a couple of years realize that it takes sometimes eight or ten years to develop enough mastery to really run your own operation. At least that's true in the ranching world. I can't really speak to the farming world, so I think that um, I think that there's a sense of sort of urgency in um, young people who are coming into agriculture and wanting to make a difference as fast as possible. And so wanting to move into a position of um, making decisions, um, maybe sometimes before they really have enough um, lived experience to be ready to be making those decisions. And so helping navigate that, um, you know, that when the apprentice feels like they're ready for something and the mentor is pretty sure they're not. I think learning how to navigate that is a place that we're continuing to try to develop as a program. But as far as the skill sheets go, I think that the more people use them as an acting way to active way to plan learning, not just record what's happened, but use it as a planning tool that really makes them even more beneficial. Yeah, agreed, Julie. That's those are really good points. Um, I totally want to echo about taking a long time to be ready to be in, you know, making decisions. Our program is only two years, and um, but we recognize that it takes much longer than two years to actually be a farm manager. That's you know a skill set that's just, I mean, that takes a long time, probably more like five to ten years. Um, so our occupation with the state is actually called a beginning farm and ranch manager. Um, and I think there's a reason, there's definitely a reason for that. You know, you're just kind of, this program is really getting you to um, the point where you're on the pathway and you're really sure that you wanna do this. Um, but yeah, it does take a while to get there. And I think it's important for folks to have, to understand that. Um, when they come in, they come in often with expectations of like, I'm going to be running the farm in two years, you know, but we have to kind of talk them down the ledge on that and explain that, no, really, this is um, where you're going to just be getting some really good, solid experience to put under your belt. Um, but you you will come out with some real skills. And and so um, on that note, the the we are in a really weird time right now with our program because we started this program as a time-based apprenticeship. Um, so in the world of registered apprenticeships, you can either be time-based or you can be competency-based. We started out as time-based and that's why we have, our goals are 3000 hours of on-the-job training. But over the years, we've recognized that becoming competency-based as a program would actually serve us better because that's actually what we're interested in, like Julie was saying. And I think, Julie, yours is a competency-based program with having those skills sheets. Um, so we are kind. We have like kind of a combo thing happening right now where we're technically a time-based, but we're moving towards a competency-based. And so we're trying to still perfect that, that model. Um, so it's, um, it's really helpful. The thing that I look at that I tend to look at the most is the baseline when they come in just to see kind of where they think they're at. Um, and it's very interesting to see like at year, the one year mark and the two year mark, sometimes 
they'll mark themselves lower in certain skills than where they started in. And I think that's really often just a recognition that they thought they knew more coming in than they actually did. And once they actually are engaging in this work, they figured out that, oh, okay, I'm actually more, it's like a course correction. I'm actually more at this level. I have still a lot to learn, which is great. Um, and I think the other thing I've learned is that we probably need to, um, there, there's areas where it just doesn't apply. Like these certain skills just don't apply on the farm. And so again, like putting those up front, like Julie does, um, and just saying, we're not going to be, you know, measuring these necessarily like this farm doesn't do flood irrigation, for example, um, taking those off the books and making that more flexible would be a better thing to do. So we're still in the process of tweaking that system, but um, but generally, I would say the trends are positive. I mean, everyone comes out learning more. And I personally get more value out of our qualitative questions that we ask when we ask the apprentices, like, what are your strengths? And what are the areas that, you know, you want to improve over the next time period, um, six months or so? Uh, and then having the farmer also chime in, like what they see as the apprentice strengths and building on those strengths. Um, those are actually really, really valuable, more so to me right now, so. Awesome, okay. I'm gonna stop our screen share because we are at time. Um, Evan, if you wanna chime in with any last minute things that you need to do on your end, please do so. But other than that, thank you so much, everyone, for joining this. Um, and we'll send a follow-up announcement email blast with any resources and attachments that our panelists would like to include. So again, thank you so much, panelists. Amazing job. I mean, thank, thank you all. You all. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Wonderful conversation. And uh, hopefully we can share, share out some of those resources with uh, the attendees in a, in a follow-up email. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, and I hope you'll uh, join us for the awards ceremony, which takes place at 6 p.m. All right. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you.